Good evening, everyone. I'm Vanessa Taholka. I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and any of them present this evening. I host Bite Into It, a weekly technology and computing show on Triple R. It's a community radio station. As someone who's fixed her share of VCRs and toasters and computers, I'm delighted that you're all here with us tonight to discuss the right to repair with our guest this evening, Kyle Wins. A keen consumer advocate and crusader against planned obsolescence, he believes in the power to unlock, modify and repair and increase the lifespan of everything you own. As CEO of iFixit, He's overseen the provision of open source repair instructions in 11 languages and he's empowered upwards of 15 million people to repair their broken stuff. Kyle is a prolific writer whose articles have been published by The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, The Harvard Business Review, Tree Hugger and my favourite, Wired. This evening, Kyle's going to share his thoughts on the value in the repair movement. Following Kyle's presentation, I'll be back to ask him some questions. And you'll all have an opportunity to ask some questions as well. So, would you please join me now in welcoming Carl Wins? Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. I have a whole bunch of stuff to show you. And I want to just kind of share a little bit about how I got into the world of repair, uh, how I kind of got excited about tinkering, and how I learned that perhaps fixing things is a path to maybe be able to fix the world. So I'm from Central California. It's kind of a nice place. We're also a college town. Uh, this, is, this is actually a photo of Cal Poly or Engineering University. I actually started I Fix It when I was in the dorms uh, right there on the hillside. And you know I was trying to fix things. And we all kind of go through the process of fixing things, right? OK. So we're all fans of the IT crowd. Um, so turning things off and on again, right? This is how you go. With Windows, it's a little bit different. Um, <laughs> So the key trick with Windows is just to wipe the, wipe the drive and start over. With a Mac, it's even simpler. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and if you go down to the Apple store and you need a new battery, they will very happily sell you a new iPhone, right? Okay, so this is how this works. Uh, so I, I kind of, I had that expression where I was like, well, I don't really want to buy a new computer. I would like to be able to spend a bit more time uh, with the thing that I already have. And um, so that's what I'm here for. I'm from the internet and uh, I, I have learned how to fix just about everything I know from the internet. And so I'm here to teach you a few things that, that we've learned on the internet. So the way that people used to know how to fix things, I'm talking like way back in the dark ages of 1990, the old ways that you would learn how to fix stuff, you kind of had a few options, right? You figured it out yourself, you figured out the hard way, this is what our grandparents did. Uh, you get a printed repair manual if you're lucky, and you go to a trade school. Like that was pretty much it, those were the options, otherwise you're just out of luck. And that's just not how things work anymore. Today we just Google it. So I fix its mission is to make Google good at teaching you how to fix things. And so if you Google something and the internet doesn't have the answer, then it's kind of my fault. So I'm trying systematically uh, to figure out how to make Google good at teaching people how to fix things. So has anybody taken apart an iPhone? Anybody here? Okay, we've got, we've got like five people here that have taken apart an iPhone. So I'm going to teach the rest of you, if you've never taken apart an iPhone, this is the process, this is how you do it. Uh, you Google it, and then you end up on this page, and then this is the process. So the first thing that you need is the special screwdriver. Uh, so all of you that have an iPhone, go ahead and pull it out and look at the bottom. Uh, and what you will notice, and particularly, the, you, well, we've got some kids here in the audience, they're going to be better at it than the rest of us, okay? This is a very, very tiny screwdriver. Uh, you can try to count the points on it, and you can squint and maybe pull out your glasses and like hold them away from your face and maybe be able to zoom in. Can anybody tell me how many points are on that screw? Five, yes. Okay, so the answer is five. We got some sharp eyesight. I guess I've got it up here. You, maybe you can see it blown up. Uh, okay, so there is no screwdriver before the iPhone that had five points. <laughs> Apple invented it to keep you out of the iPhone. So the step one of getting into the iPhone is to have the forbidden screwdriver. Uh, I brought one with me. 
Uh, we like to give away uh, screwdrivers. We, we call it Liberation Week, where we help people free their phones, and we give away tens of thousands of these screwdrivers. Apple doesn't want you to have them, so we figure it out, and we show you how. So this is, this is then you need a suction cup, which you could use like a suction cup that you have in your shower, and you just pop the thing open. And then two Phillips screws. Now, isn't it fascinating that they use the secret screw on the outside, but once you get inside, they just use normal Phillips screws. This is the same screw that you have to fix your eyeglasses, very common. And then you get the battery, and uh, so this is disconnecting the battery. Okay, does anybody know what you do with your phone if you drop it in the toilet or you drop it in water? Rice. Okay, that is, that, right? Rice is the most common thing. Do not do that. <laughs> do not put your phone in rice. What, what will happen if you put your phone in rice is that like the, the, the like goopy, gluteny, ricey stuff will just migrate inside your phone. Uh, and it will, I guess, sort of dry it out, but not really. What you actually need to do is remove power from the phone. So what you want to do is turn it off. That's the first thing you want to do. The problem is it doesn't have a power button anymore. Right? They took the power buttons off of our phone. So you drop it in water, you're kind of hosed. You need to turn it off. You need to remove power. And so the answer is get the special screwdriver that they won't give you, take it apart, and disconnect the battery. That's the answer. But, of course, nobody can do that because we don't have the screwdriver. <laughs> Uh, so, so then, now we're like, okay, I've got my phone, I need to, I'm going to put in a new battery. So they actually glued the battery down, but in this case, Apple was nice to us, and they have these handy little pull tabs. So this is called a command adhesive, and you pull on the string, and it actually kind of frees the adhesive. So this is pretty cool. Uh, it works most of the time, and, and <laughs> the most of the time is kind of sad, because when it doesn't work, then you're like heating it up with a hair dryer and prying, and it gets kind of aggressive. But most of the time, swapping out the battery in an iPhone is pretty easy. And there we go, this is pulling the pull tab off. So we actually think that just about anybody can, can swap the, the battery in an iPhone. You just need the special screwdriver and to know a little bit about how this adhesive works. And there the battery comes out, so not too bad. So this is the idea with iFixit, is that we're trying to build a community where we're teaching everybody how to fix all their stuff. And if we make it easy for people to share what they know, then perhaps we can connect people across the internet. Because I know how to fix a couple things. Probably all of you know how to fix a couple things. We probably don't know how to fix the same things. If we share what we know, we're all better off. Uh, so we've built an open source gu set of guides. It's kind of like Wikipedia for fixing stuff. And we have instructions on all kinds of products. Uh, so we you know, started out with things that were made by Apple, but we quickly branched into other things. My dad actually ran a Harley Davidson uh, shop for when I was growing up. And so it was very fun for me to finally get Harley Davidson like oil change guides on the site. This is kind of a fun product. This is the very first product that ever had the Sony radio, or the Sony logo on it. This is a transistor radio. It's like the original transistor radio. And this is inside. And do we have any electrical engineers in the audience? OK. All right. What is the value of that resistor? Huh? All right. There you go. So what, what he, he's telling you, this is a resistor. And the color codes tell you the value of, of the resistance. So like back in the day, you could open something up and look at it and know exactly how it worked. That's not really the case anymore. These days, you have to have a circuit schematic because it doesn't, it doesn't have the pretty color coding on it. OK, people always ask me, what's the most fun thing that you've ever taken apart? And my answer is Pleo. Pleo is a toy dinosaur. Pleo is adorable. Uh, if you pet Pleo, he's got a little vibration motor in it, and he purrs. Pleo's adorable. And so of course, the first thing I did when I got Pleo was I cut him open, <laughs> right? And so this is inside Pleo. <laughs> It was kind of an emotional, sad experience. Pleo had over 70 screws, 12 motors. Like, Pleo was kind of a, a process to disassemble. But isn't he cool? So the engineers who made this, like, must have had the most fun job in the world. Uh, phenomenal toy. And of course, a toy with all these mechanical components is going to break. And so we took them apart and sh show people how to do it. Most of the time, our tools, you know, are screwdrivers. But Pleo actually required a scalpel to get them open. This was kind of a fun thing that we did. This is, anybody know what this is? It's a lightsaber, yes. And so, of course, if you get a lightsaber, the first thing you have to do is take it apart. And then because it's a lightsaber, you're taking it apart. Sometimes it accidentally turns on while you're taking it apart and you cut your hand off. But that's OK. <laughs> you continue, right? And uh, so this is a lightsaber completely disassembled. Um, this is actually, this is a replica made by an engineer who is a super fan of Star Wars. And, and so his spare time hobby is machining. And he made this lightsaber. The, the replica is actually much better than the props that they used on the set. It's just a phenomenal piece of engineering. There's really only one in the world. <laughs> 
and we took it apart. Actually, we took it apart, and then we lost a piece, and we're, we're searching in our lab, and it, it, we were very much sweating bullets for about two hours until we found the tiny piece that had rolled under the desk. This is common with repair, right? Uh, this is kind of fun. This is the new VR headset. So we've taken apart every VR headset we can get our hands on, and this is the inside. Uh, and, and we're doing this with more and more products because the idea is we want to make it fun and exciting for people to learn about new products and, and how they go together. Um, this is a... This is a espresso machine. It was given to me by a friend who had a, he says, will you fix my Starbucks barista? This is the problem when you run a company called iFixes. People all come to you with their things and say, please, will you fix my thing? And I say, no, I'm not going to fix it for you. You fix it. And, uh, and they don't do that. And so then he's like, you can just have the coffee machine. So I have no idea how coffee machines work. I don't even really drink coffee. And I definitely don't know how espresso machines work. Uh, but I do have screwdrivers. And I'm, you know, so I just took it apart. And I posted pictures. And I said, I have no idea how to fix this thing. But this is how you take it apart. So I posted this online. Okay, uh, and I'll come back to that. Uh, so there's lots of folks that are on our site taking things apart, and, and this is really what makes the community work, is uh, this is a this is a old Mercedes car, and this is owned by one of our community members from Arizona. His name is Nicholas, and he's been posting repair guides as a hobby for a long time, and he has posted tons and tons of these guides. I've used them myself. I have a friend with this car, and he's done a really good job writing them, and his guides just go on and on, uh, and so if you want to know how to bleed the brakes, in your car, he's got a guide that will help you out. And this is actually, this is, this is Nicholas here. He's phenomenal. And so this, this process of someone who's interested in the topic, passionate about it, documenting what they know, putting it online, is hugely successful. It's actually gotten to the point where the repair manual that Nicholas has written for this particular car is more comprehensive than the original service manual that came from the manufacturer. So Nicholas has just done a phenomenal job. It's been really cool. Uh, so why does that matter? Why is that important? Well, cars are generally designed to be fixable. They're designed to be easy to get in and, and, and take apart, um, right? Brakes are designed to be bled and to be worked on. But that's not necessarily the case with a lot of modern products. So I spend a lot of time trying to encourage product designers to be more environmentally friendly, to make things easier to fix. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is we rate products from 1 to 10 with how easy or hard they are to fix. So these are some of the current phones that are out there in the marketplace, and you can kind of see how they stack up. Uh, it's interesting. We have both the Google Nexus 6P and the 5X that both released by Google at the same time. They look the same on the outside. One is really easy to fix. One is really hard to fix. There's no way you would know unless you took them apart ahead of time, but of course, you're not going to do that before you buy a device. And you can see the iPhone actually scores pretty well. Uh, so this is a Samsung S7 does not score well. So I showed you how to take apart an iPhone. Let me show you how to take apart a Samsung. So this is Samsung's new S7 Edge. Uh, and this, you know, this is the outside. Does anybody have this phone? It's a pretty good phone. Yeah, we got some folks back here. Yeah, so it's a good phone. Uh, do not drop it. It's my warning. Okay. And the reason is that in order to get inside this phone, the very first thing that you need is to apply heat. So I could use a heat gun, which is like a hair dryer that sets your hair on fire. Or we have this handy eye opener. So this is a, a sack of gel. You stick it in the microwave. You run it for a couple of minutes. It heats up. And then you can use it to apply heat. So you apply heat to it. And then I have this suction cup pry tool that we call an ice clack and a guitar pick. And you kind of systematically pry your way through. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping past about 20 minutes of cursing. <laughs> right? And there the back magically comes off. And then you know, the process of getting to the battery is actually fairly tedious. So the reason that this is a problem is that every phone needs a new battery every 400 charges or so. So you're talking, if you buy a phone and you charge it every day, that's about a year, year and a half, you need to get a new battery for your phone. Highly recommend if you've had a phone for a year or two and you feel like it's slower, the battery isn't lasting as long as it used to, put a new battery in it before you think about buying a new phone. Of course, the problem is if there's a whole bunch of glue between you and the battery, maybe you're less motivated to do that, or you go to a repair shop and they're going to charge you more labor because it takes a while. Uh, so this is where our repairability score comes in, is we say, hey, a device like this is going to get a 3 out of 10. Maybe it shouldn't do as well in the marketplace as something that gets a 7 or an 8 or a 9. 
Uh, and, and we've been publishing these repairability scores for a long time, and I think they're starting to have an impact, but ideally every product that you buy would have the repairability score stamped on the side of it. Or you go and you buy a kettle and it says, this kettle will last approximately four months. Right? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if it said that? <laughs> we've all had this problem. It turns out that like, particularly the cheap kettles are completely fused together and impossible to fix. So when the heating element burns out, you're hosed, and then you go back and hopefully you spend more on a better one next time. This has big environmental impact because the amount of raw material that goes into manufacturing these things is just absolutely massive. Uh, it's over 500 pounds of carbon dioxide emitted in the process of making a laptop. Uh, it's just incredible how much raw material it takes to go into and it gets concentrated into this little tiny chip and you have no idea how much effort is involved up front in manufacturing it. Uh, and then at end of life, we have these challenges where they end up all over the world. Uh, so this is a map that a friend of mine uh, put together. This is kind of an approximate guess at where some of the electronics are traveling. And manufacturers tend to make a product, ship it, and then forget about it and pretend like it didn't exist. But they actually have these incredible afterlives where they move around the world. Uh, and so when I was in college, I got curious. I heard about this e-waste problem, and I heard about some of the travels of electronics around the world, and I was kind of skeptical, and I didn't believe it. Uh, and I saw these kind of you know, suspected destinations on these maps, and I was like, eh, I'm just going to go find out. So I decided to start traveling, and I bought myself a plane ticket to Accra, Ghana, uh, where I found this. So this is a scrapyard that's called Egbogloshi. Uh, it's in the, uh, right in the capital of Accra. This actually looks like it'd be out in the countryside. No, this is pretty darn close to the capital. Uh, and this is a former lagoon, um, and this is not a junkyard. This isn't where like things are going to end up. This is actually a scrapyard where they're processing equipment and they're mining it for raw materials. They're effectively recycling. Uh, so this is a pile of old computer monitors that are going to be ground up and turned back into plastic of some kind. Uh, here's a keyboard in the middle of its kind of end of life process. And then I kind of looked off, and, and there's a soccer field on one side, and then there was a big field, and there was a whole bunch of smoke. And so, of course, I did what any of you would do. I walked toward the smoke. And I just about dropped my camera, because this guy was walking toward me with a computer that was on fire. Like, Why are you doing that? And, and then I went farther, and, and I met this kid who was actually, he was burning um, wires, and he was taking the starter motors out of cars, and he was burning the plastic off of them. And I'm like, why are you doing this? He says, well, we can't sell the copper if it's got plastic on it. We have to separate the plastic from the copper. So that's what he's doing. He's basically mining the electronics to get the raw materials out. And I would ask them, well, well, why are you doing this? Or how long have you been doing this? He says, well, I do it because I make about $5 a day. And that's better than I could make doing anything else. OK. So how long have you been doing this? He says, well, I've been here about six months. I'm like, OK, well, do you have any kind of like health side effects? He says, well, I've, I've got this kind of nasty cough. I'm like, OK, well, how long have you had the cough for? And he said, about six months. I'm like, well, maybe there's a correlation. And I spent an entire day there talking with these guys and, and getting to know them and getting to know their story. And by the end of it, I felt like the insides of my lungs were coated in plastic. And I just didn't want to be there anymore. And I feel so bad for these kids that they're there every day. Uh, so the answer is not necessarily to regulate these folks into oblivion. What we need is to find a way to give them a job where they can make more money than $5 a day. Uh, and as I look at kind of the sorts of materials that they're processing, I think, gee, it, it, maybe we could do something better. Maybe we could teach people how to, how to repair these things. So I was talking with the Pope about it. Not really. Uh, but the Pope is on Twitter. You know, we have all these famous people on Twitter these days. Some of them I like more than others, and so I really like the Pope. Uh, and the Pope has been talking about environmental issues a lot. Um, and, and he thinks that, like, a lot, if you, if you analyze the problem, what's going into these scrapyards, it's not necessarily the problem happening at end of life. The problem is the amount of stuff that we are generating and consuming and tossing away. Uh, and and he, you know, he says, to blame population growth and not an extreme po uh, consumerism on the part of some is one way of refusing to face the issue. So we have this problem where we have just too much stuff, and we're buying things without regard for how long they last, how long we're going to be able to use them. Uh, if you look globally at the amount of phones, so this is, this is a stat from 2012, 1.6 billion cell phones are manufactured in 2012. We're up over, over 2 billion phones this year, or in 2016. Uh, so that you're talking about making a new phone for every single person on the planet every two years or so at that rate, every two to three years. And that, that, that really maybe is too much. 
Uh, in America, we consume phones for an average of about 18 months, and then we toss them in our drawer because we don't want to throw them away because we'll feel bad if we throw it away. But if we put it in a drawer, we're not going to feel bad because we're saving it for somebody, right? And then it sits in a drawer for five or six years until we don't feel bad about throwing it away anymore, and then we throw it away. And this is, this is kind of a very typical trend, right? So uh, you say, well, that's fine because we can just recycle it. Well, we're not very good at recycling these things. Out of all the elements on the periodic table, about 50 of them, the ones that are colored in here, 50 of them are in your cell phone. There's neodymium in the, in the magnet, in the, in the microphone, and then the speaker. There is a huge amount of other kinds of raw materials. And... Only the ones in green were really good at re recovering and recycling. So we talk about lithium and the lithium shortages around the world and how we're going to Bolivia and Afghanistan to get lithium. We can't really recover that in recycling. You look at cobalt that comes out of the Congo and these artisanal mines where there's really dangerous conditions that people are mining these things in. And we're not very good at, at getting cobalt out and recycling. Um, as a matter of fact, if you took a truck full of old cell phones, ground them up, melted them down, there would be absolutely no way to make new cell phones out of them. So recycling isn't really a great term when it comes to electronics. Like we can recover some material, but we're never going to get back and, and get all of it, all of it back. As a matter of fact, indium, one of the rarers that's on this chart, uh, the electronics industry uses about two thirds of the world, the world's indium supply, and we're projected to run out by 2050. And we don't know what we'll do next. Maybe we'll start mining asteroids. I don't know. Or maybe we'll start making fewer than two billion new phones a year. So there's another angle on this, which is, well, we have this environmental challenge, but there's also this huge economic opportunity if we start fixing things. Uh, so this stat that you know, for every 1,000 tons of electronics, landfilling it basically doesn't create any jobs. Fixing it creates a lot of jobs. Uh, and and this, is, this is consistently true if you look all the way through. Manufacturing doesn't really create that many jobs anymore. A lot of it is mechanized. If you look at something like an iPhone, Apple doesn't make the iPhone, right? Foxconn makes the iPhone. Apple only pays Foxconn $5 for the labor to manufacture one iPhone. It's only $5 in labor. So if we talk about bringing manufacturing jobs back here from Asia, you're only going to create $5 worth of jobs. But if you fix it, if you take your phone down to a shop and you pay them to put a new battery in, maybe you're paying them $30 or $40 in labor for an hour to put, put a new battery in. If you pay them to fix a screen, that's another $50 in labor. Over the course of a phone's life, if we can make it last five, six, seven years, you might have well over $100 in labor in making a phone continue to function compared to $5 up front. So you're talking 20 times the economic opportunity, increasing more repair happening locally rather than, than just bringing manufacturing back. Uh, same thing with, with recycling. Like if we can make the recycling organizations more of a reuse first, recycling second, we're going to create a lot more economic opportunity. So this is, this is kind of the core thesis that we built iFix around. It's like, hey, we're throwing things away or we're melting things in scrapyards in Ghana. And we don't really know how to fix them very well. If we could get better at fixing them, then it would save the planet a little bit. And it would also create a lot more local jobs. So that's what we've been up to. And um, we've, we've been kind of running some analysis. And we think that if we, if we, like, we did a simulation, we found that if we did very, very conservative and said, let's only pick about a quarter of the electronics that are sitting there out of use, we started fixing them, we'd be able to create 250,000 jobs just in the US. And so, so this is an illustration. Like, this is where we're at. Uh, we used to have repair shops. Everything was happy. We don't have as many anymore. And we're drowning in stuff. Um, so let me go back to that, that espresso machine that I had. So I took it apart, and I posted pictures online. And I said, here's how to take it apart. The following week, I got an email from a lady who said, thank you so much for teaching me how to fix my espresso machine. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I didn't teach you how to fi fix anything. I just taught you how to take it apart. And she says, no, no, it was clogged. And all I had to do was take it apart. And then I cleaned the line. And I put it back together. And it was good. I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, and so then what happened, you'll note that there's an edit button on this repair guide. Uh, so then people started adding to my manual. And they said, actually, if you get a multimeter, and then they include instructions on how to use the multimeter. And they said, if you just measure the impedance or the resistance across these two connections, you can tell if the heating element is what's burned out or not. And if the heating element is burned out, here's a link to buy it online. You can throw it in. And your espresso machine works again. I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. I didn't know any of that. I didn't even know how the thing worked when it was functional, much less how to fix it. But you know, people added to what I, what I started. So I kind of planted a seed, and people built on top of it. And I was looking today, and this particular repair manual has been looked at 149,000 times. 
So all of a sudden, a few photos online starts to, to snowball, and you have a fairly big material impact. And clearly, Starbucks has made more than 149,000 of these coffee machines. And there's a lot of people out there that want to fix them. And there isn't really a local espresso machine repairman that you can take it to. So it's kind of incumbent on the rest of us to figure out how to fix these things. So we have this challenge with, with products where we have to have kind of individual specific repair procedures for these. So for the iPhones, we've got this solved. We've got repair manuals on iFixit for every single iPhone. Here's all the different phones. Here's a repair manual for the iPhone 6. This is the problem with Android. So these are all the different Android models that are out there. So there's so many products that having like happy, like, you know, Starbucks barista espresso repair instructions for each different Android phone is really a challenge. Uh, so we're trying. Uh, so we've got every single Android phone manufacturer up here with Samsung. We've written manuals for 93 different Samsung phones. So I only had to write them for eight iPhones. I've got 93 Samsung phones and I don't have them all yet. And we're continuing to plug away at this problem. Um, but the real challenge is that the manufacturers aren't participating in the solution, or most manufacturers aren't. Uh, I want to tell you a quick story to kind of conclude this about a company out of Amsterdam called Fairphone. So this is the Fairphone. It's uh, the world's kind of first modular, repairable cell phone. And before they started working on the phone, they came to us and said, hey, we want to develop a repairable phone. Will you help us? And I said, yes, absolutely. Thank God. Somebody wants to. <laughs> and so we helped them in the design process. And then they said, and we want to make sure when we release it that there's a repair manual available online for the phone. And we said, great, we'd love to help you work on that. And so we helped them. And they actually now include an app on the phone that has a repair manual for the phone. And then we were able to work with them. So this is, this is the, the phone. It's very easy to take apart. I didn't even show you the disassembly instructions because it's so, so straightforward. And then uh, now we're able to sell repair parts for it. So they're actually like making manuals and parts and training available. And, and it's so cool to see a manufacturer that's really saying from the beginning, we're going to design this thing to last a long time. And we're going to support people all the way through. Uh, so we're really excited to see that some companies are starting to get it and understand the global issue. And, and are really take, uh, you know, picking up some leadership. And so it got a 10 out of 10 because Fairphone is awesome. Uh, and I'd like to see more devices like that in the future. So with that, I'm going to kind of stop talking. We're going to switch modes a little bit and have a bit more of a conversation. That was fantastic. It was quite a lot of information to take in. But um, rather than just doing a QA and a here, what we'd really like to do is get a little bit hands-on because Carl's brought in these tools and um, a mixer with potential. And we wonder if there might be a young person out in the audience, a young person with some fixing potential, perhaps someone, you know, under 16. Is there someone who's feeling a little bit, you know, you don't have to achieve anything particular. Would you like to come up here? So the gizmo that I have here, all right. I'm Vanessa, what's your name? Leo. Leo. Nice to meet you, Leo, this is Carl. Leo, have a seat here. And what I have, this is a KitchenAid mixer, uh, and, and uh, we're going to take it apart. How does that sound? You going to take it apart? Yeah. Okay. There you go. This one's, this one's your microphone, so if you have any questions to ask, feel free to just pick it up and we'll ask them, and we'll ask you some questions as you go along. And so here's a pry tool, and since there's no screws that are visible on the outside of it, you're going to have to pry your way into this, which kind of sounds like fun, right? Uh, so I'm going to give you a hint. And uh, this piece needs to come off first. So see if you can pry and get that piece off. Excellent. Ooh. So maybe point it away from you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is not a sharp tool. This is a kind of like, uh, uh, like butter knife type of uh, pry tool that we call the jimmy for prying things open. Do you want to give a little bit of guidance just for this sure. first step, maybe, Carl? So let's let's see if we can get in here, and we're gonna we're gonna pry along. So this is like not particularly designed to be taken apart, right? They uh, they they didn't they didn't want to make your life easy when they sold this product. So you gotta gotta find a crevice and then work your way in. There we go. Let's see if you can get that All open. Right. There. Hey, there we go. Cool. So now yes. we're inside. <laughs> And so now you're going to need a screwdriver. And you see, you see these two holes here? And so there's your screwdriver. So you'll want to whack it on one of those pen type things. This guy here. <laughs> and then this bit. And let me set this up for you. So Kyle, while we're looking at this, did you have a favorite tool growing up? Were you that sort of kid? 
I, I mean, I like screwdrivers. <laughs> I just think they're just kind of fun. And there's so many different types of screwdrivers. Um, we've been doing a blog series lately where we're going back. Do you have Robertson screws here in Australia? Robertson, they're the square screws. I'm only aware of the, uh, the Phillips head and the Stanley. So back in the day, there was, like, Robertson predated Phillips. And so there was Mr. Robertson and Mr. Phillips. And they both had a screw. And uh, uh, Ford, uh, Ford Motor Company was kind of trying to figure out which one to use. And uh, uh, Phillips convinced them, and Robertson didn't. And the rest is history. And so that's why you have cross-shaped screws instead of, instead of uh, square screws. So you've shown us quite a few techniques already for getting into things. We've, we've seen a lot of unique screwdrivers. We've seen an interesting use of heat, which is probably unexpected to most of us. I don't know about you. I didn't think about putting my, my wheat bag on the back of a Samsung phone to get into it. But what is the most creative approach that you've seen to fixing something, Kyle? Like, what, What's the weirdest thing you've seen have to be done to get into something? Well, I mean, we're constantly t like tinkering. I mean, sometimes, uh, so very frequently, we end up having to cut something open. So if we can't find the screws, so I use the Dremel a fair amount um, you know, with a rotary tool and just cut the case off, which is frustrating and destructive and not ideal, but sometimes you have to. You don't often use the fire method. I try, I try not to. Absolutely. So you founded iFixit in 2003 out of your dorm room at university. What was the series of events that led you to get passionate enough about this to actually do something about the problem? Yeah, so this story sadly involves a Dremel as well. So I had a laptop and I dropped it on uh, off the bed and it was, the power plug was just a little bit loose. And so I figured, well, if I take it apart, I can just solder it and it'll, it'll be good again. My grandfather gave me a soldering iron on my way to university. So I was like, okay, cool. I can do this, right? And so I started trying to take it apart, and very quickly I got stuck. And so I did what all of us would do, and I Googled it. And there wasn't information online, and so I kind of muddied my way through the repair. And I think, like we all know, like the first time you take something apart is such a challenge. You just don't know, and so you break little tabs and latches. So I got the laptop apart, and I soldered it. And then, you know, I was a college student, so of course this was 3 a.m. that I was doing this, and I was tired. And so I went to bed, and then I woke up the next morning, and I realized that I had made a terrible mistake. Uh, because it was still in pieces, and I had no idea how to put it back together. So I Googled it again, and I couldn't find anything. And so I started putting it back together, and I had all these tabs and latches. And so I couldn't figure out how to get it all back together. And so I took the Dremel, and I started cutting tabs off. And eventually I got the thing back together. And that was, you know, and so that, like, it kind of the same experience that he's going through here. Like, how does this come apart? I don't know. Let's start, you know, pulling things off and see. It's a lot easier if you have a map. Okay, so since 2003, your website exists now. A lot of other things have changed out there in the market. People are building things different ways. The, the uh, regulatory frameworks in different countries have changed right. a lot. What, what sort of changes have you seen that have been significant to the right to repair movement? It, there isn't a whole lot of protection for consumers around repair right now. With, in the automotive realm, there is. So if, if you go to a local garage and they can work on your car, like the local garage, they'll fix anything. They'll fix a Honda, they'll fix a Toyota, they'll fix a, a General Motors car. And the reason that they'll fix anything is that they have access to repair information from the car manufacturers. The car manufacturers are not sharing this out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, they're sharing it because they're required to by right to repair laws that have been on the books for cars. And so that's why we have an independent auto repair industry. Unfortunately, we don't have that for any other types of products. Uh, there's no right to repair for KitchenAid mixers. And so there's no requirement at all that KitchenAid sell parts for these things. And as a general rule, they don't. Um, so it would be nice, I mean, we do it for very expensive things by, like cars, but we don't have any regulatory framework for everything else. So some of the software you've, um, oh, some of the software in vehicles and things that, that people might want to get in is complicating the fixing nowadays. So people used to be able to go in and mechanically fix a lot of things in right. their cars, but that process is, um, is getting more complex. In the States, you've got the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has some protections for consumers. So they've got some um, allowances for the public to go and tinker within their machines in the interest of good faith security research and for lawful modification. Right. Do you think that those, those um, exemptions within the Copyright Act go far enough? 
Yeah, so we have, we have this very unfortunate thing. The, the DMCA has a, a provision that says that it's illegal to modify software and hardware that you don't own. It, it, it technically says that it's illegal to circumvent a technological protection measure, but effectively everything has a technological protection measure in it, so it's basically saying it's illegal to modify your stuff. Uh, and I know all of you are saying, well, this is American copyright law. What in the world does that have to do with us? Uh, the section of the DMCA that I'm talking about here is in the TPP treaty. Uh, so if you signed on to the TPP treaty, which I think you did, right? Yeah. So you all might be stuck with American copyright law. We're really good at exporting our laws, <laughs> particularly the nasty ones. Uh, so the, the, the trick with this is that in, in any there's a escape hatch where you can apply for exemptions and, and you pretty much have to, for any type of thing that you want to repair, you have to apply for an exemption. So we applied for an exemption for repairing phones. We had to apply for a different exemption for repairing tablets. We had to apply for a different exemption for smart watches uh, and a different one for tractors and a different one for cars and a different one for motorcycles. And it ends up like being this lawsuit for each type of thing. Did we lose a screw? Oh, there you got it open. Oh, that's okay. Uh, all right, so th there we go. So tell me, tell me, what are you seeing inside this? Uh, can you describe what we're looking at here? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think this thing is? That's. You see, there's a bunch of copper in there. That's the motor, I think. There you go. That's right. And then, and then, what do we have here? What are these white things? Um. These white round things back down in there with the with the teeth on them. What are those? Here we can, I think this will come out. There we go, we'll pull it out. So what's that? That's a gear. There you go, it's a gear. Okay, so it turns out that a mixer is really just a motor and some gears. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Uh, and, and so what, what is this gear, this white, what is it made out of? Um, what do you think? Plastic. There you go, okay. So we've got a, metal, a very fairly beefy metal motor with these uh, like, you know, fairly flimsy little plastic gears. And, and this strikes me like a recipe for something that is designed to fail fairly quickly. And as a matter of fact, I've got little bits of plastic that are chunking off of this thing already. So Leo, did you find that hard to get into? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you got it pretty open. Okay, so you've got, you've got this open. Now we've got a, what we have here, we have a gear shaft here and a fan, right? And a motor, and that's pretty much it. There's just, there's just a motor and a shaft and a couple of, of gears and then that's your mixer. So this is actually a fairly straightforward thing, um, but it becomes very evident that they've got metal parts meshing with plastic parts, and that's probably what's going to break. Leo, how old are you? Nine. Do you think anyone in this room could do what you just did? Probably. <laughs> Isn't that a great vote of confidence? <laughs> Thank you so much for helping us out. Do you want to head back into the audience? Thank you very much. Thanks, Leo. <laughs> That was some very deft work there with yeah, the magnetic pretty good screws with it. and everything. Good work. So this is like this repair would be trivial if you could get a new gear. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they're making gears available. And you also very quickly by taking it apart realize that maybe this is not the most quality mixer in in the world. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about copyright law. I don't want to let the legal side of things drop just yet because um, in Nebraska today, uh, well sort of tomorrow in American time, but actually on the date of today in our time, mm -hmm. um, there's a piece of legislation being debated and it's a right to repair law. And there's a lot of hope that this will get somewhere and have a knock-on effect in different states. Similar legislation is being floated in Illinois, Kansas, Minnesota, New York, Massachusetts, Tennessee, Wyoming. So the legislation itself would require companies, whether they're in the tech sector or not, to make their service manuals, diagnostic tools and parts available to consumers and repair shops and not just select suppliers so that they can't have, say, a closed Honda shop, for example. Now, Kyle, how do you feel about the um, potential success or failure of, of this piece of legislation? Yeah, so this is really exciting because for the first time ever, we're really starting to consider this. Yeah. Uh, we've had these laws on the books for cars. We haven't had them for anything else. And so there's been this grassroots campaign to introduce these laws. And it, it's, I mean, we've introduced bills in, in eight states. We haven't passed one anywhere yet. And so the question is, can we pass it? Uh, and the answer is that um, there's two companies in particular that really don't like this legislation uh, that have been pulling out all the stops trying to, trying to stop it. And so I imagine all of you can guess the first company. It's Apple. Okay. Can anyone guess the second company? Samsung. Samsung would be a good guess. Yeah. So it's none of the companies you just mentioned. It's actually John Deere. 
John Deere doesn't want farmers to be able to fix their own tractors. Why doesn't John Deere want farmers to be able to fix their own tractors? Well, it turns out that they're making a lot of money off these service contracts, and they're locking them down. And so the same way that Apple locks down iPhones, John Deere's actually doing the same thing with, with tractors. So that's why it's Nebraska. So let's take this issue um, one criticism at a time. From Apple's point of view, they claim that these laws will embolden hackers and make Nebraska the mecca for bad actors, you know, for, for unconscionable, you know, operators selling dodgy parts that right. might create, you know, I don't know, more batteries that, that burn up, that sort right. of thing. Um, how authentic do you feel like that argument is? <laughs> yeah, so I, I call this fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD. Uh, and they're throwing every objection that they can at the wall to see what sticks. So in this case, they're saying, well, if people could, could you know, had access to the diagnostic software to repair their device, they'd be able to hack it. Um, I, I guess. Uh, it's their device. Like people ought to be able to do what they want. I mean, and this is like we've got manufacturers are flipping this ownership thing on its head, where they're saying, "Well, you shouldn't be able to hack your own device." Well, it's mine. I paid you for it. Stop acting like you still own it. Uh, and and uh, I mean, this this kind of, the kind of thing happens over and over again. Like, you know, sell me the product, make the 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 parts available, and I'll use it for as long as I possibly can. And if I want to take my iPhone and turn it into a temperature sensor, I should, ought to be able to do that. Absolutely. So when we look at cars in particular, occasionally an argument that I've heard against um, planned obsolescence being a bad thing is that, say, car manufacturers will say, well, actually, because the technology is always improving upon itself, we don't actually want to have cars out there that are 20 years old and operating less efficient engines and creating more pollution. Right. And there are countries where there's legislation, say in Japan, about how old your car can be and still be operating on the road or right. how long you have to wait before you recondition your engine, for example. What do you think about that sort of argument? Yeah, I mean, it's a good argument. Singapore is very aggressive on this, right? They want to get the old cars off the road. Uh, I think you, ha you just have to look at it from an environmental perspective and say, what, what is the impact of manufacturing it? What is the impact of using it over its life? Um, there was a famous study done where they, they did an analysis, an environmental analysis between a Hummer and a Toyota Prius. And it turned out that the Hummer ended up being more environmentally friendly because of all of the extensive amount of manufacturing that went into the first Priuses. Now, it's gotten better since then, and so that argument isn't valid anymore. But if you look at something like a cell phone, over its lifespan, uh, at, this is Apple's numbers, if, if, if an iPhone lasts for seven years and you're plugging into the wall and charging it every day for seven years, at the end of that seven years, 80% of its environmental impact was in manufacturing before you ever got it. Only 20% was plugging it into the wall. Do you think that we're kind of being thrown a red herring anyway in that maybe they should be building things more along the Fairphone model? Sure, make it so that you can upgrade it so you can improve efficiency over time. And I mean, that would be nice with cars, right? And I think we'll get there with electric cars. I don't think we're going to be wanting, once you have a fully electric car, you won't need to upgrade it every five or 10 years, right? Maybe you want to change out the upholstery and change out the battery, but the cars themselves ought to start lasting 30, 40 years. So we've been speaking from a very privileged Western, you know, capitalist access to stuff type of perspective. But you did allude to the impact that this is having on um, less uh, economically comfortable nations and the environmental impacts, the socioeconomic impacts. Right. I wonder, could you speak at all to maybe some of the, the political impacts that you might have seen? Um, for example, you wrote an article about um, some political unrest in Tunisia where uh, people shut down the... Uh, the free access to the internet and how routers and their firmware might have had a bit of an impact on this. Can you, can you um, describe that a little bit for us? Sure. I mean, I think open access to technology is really important. I, I, you know, I, it, it's easy to look and say, well, look at all the environmental problems that come from electronics. We just shouldn't have any. And that, that would be crazy. Like, you know, electronics are dramatically making our lives better. I think access to telecommunications, access to a cell phone is effectively a fundamental human right now. Everybody should have the right to be able to communicate with everyone else. Uh, so there's environmental questions of how do we do it sustainably, but there's also questions of, of you know, being able to like, fully understand your hardware uh, and know that the government isn't spying on you in the process of that. 
Uh, and so we ran into some issues with, with firmware on, on wireless routers where the manufacturers were making it so that you couldn't put open source firmware on your routers. And so there, there's lots of us. There's, there's some really cool tools. There's one called DDWRT that makes it really easy. Have you, have you put this on the router? I haven't personally, but it's I've It's fantastic. It. Yeah. It's really cool for all kinds of things. But just being able to tinker with your router and make it better is something that's great. But also, you could, you could tinker with your router and install something like Tor and, and use it. I've been in situations. I was actually in Egypt during some of the unrest. And we had photos of police brutality that we needed to get out. And we had to use encryption to get it out. And having access to kind of the fundamental technology is really important. Um, so when manufacturers try to completely lock us out all the way through, that, that creates potential challenges for civil liberties. I think that's a really great point because when we look at our technology and it being locked down, we don't necessarily think of that as being a political problem in the future or something that you know, might enable or lock down our freedoms. Right. So. And I have friends, as we, as we look to medical devices that are implanted in our bodies, this mm. is going to be a major issue. You talk about having a pacemaker that's implanted, it would be nice to do a security on it. I'll audit on it. I have a friend who, you know, she's got a pacemaker and she wants access to the medical data that's coming off of her pacemaker. She says, it's my body, it should be my data. She doesn't necessarily have access to that data right now. And that's this, this copyright law is completely inadvertently giving the manufacturers control of all kinds of things. And it turns out these things are our lives. There are communications, there are our physical functions. This is really critical. I think we need to open up to some questions from the audience. You've been so polite there. And uh, we have a roving mic over here. There's someone in the front row if you wanted to make a dash, but uh, otherwise, I'm sure there's a few faces out there. Thank you so much. You could give her the southern mic back, too. Mm. Yeah, um, a couple of questions, actually. Um, do you, were you, are you thinking about having repairability um, scores for other items? Obviously, people would be interested in stuff for like one of these, be you know, like one of these things here. It'd be great to know that before I went out and purchased one of those. It'd be good to know whether I could repair it. Um, and are you concerned, perhaps, as if the repairability legislation gets through, that manufacturers will just move to other models where they won't maybe not sell the item anymore, but they'll like you know, Microsoft does for their Outlook product, they'll just lease it to you. So, in fact, it'll be their product. So you actually won't be able to tinker with it because they, you actually won't ever own it. Great questions. Uh, so to answer your first question about a repairability scoring system, so we've published how we score products. We'd welcome anyone else, if there's any journalists that want to start scoring products, I will happily teach you how we do it. Uh, we actually got some funding from the European Commission to build an open uh, scoring system that could be used for more kinds of products. So that's a, that's a project that we're working on right now. I've got a couple people working on software to make it easy to score any product, not just a cell phone. Uh, and I hope that we'll have some results in a year or two. Uh, we're making progress on it. Um, your second question about a shift to leasing models and a shift to control, yeah, absolutely, that, that's a possibility, right? The moment that you're leasing something, you lease a cable box or, or something, then you're effectively passing off control. Hopefully that's a choice that consumers can make and that we'll always have a choice, but I think you do have to realize if you're leasing something and not owning it, uh, you're giving away a lot of the freedoms that you have associated with it. Uh, if I was a manufacturer trying to counter this, I, I think you're right. I'd go in that direction. So it's up to us to kind of decide, do we want to be owning things or do we just want to be using them? Um, I was really interested in the role of 3D printing in um, repair. You know, plastics are in a lot of these products, but they can be printed as well. Yeah, I was just around the corner here at the office works. they've got 3D printers and you can just give them a file and they'll print it. And so that's really cool because all of a sudden it takes all of the, um, I mean, it, it's really, does anybody have a 3D printer at home? Okay, so we've got, we've got three people in the room. Like, it's fairly rare. Like, most people aren't going to have 3D printers. So it would be great. And I mean, this part potentially is one. I don't know how well 3D printing a gear would work, but it seems Potential, it works. Okay, so it seems possible. Uh, where for like cell phones, you can't really 3D print cell phone repair parts, but for kitchen appliances, you certainly could. So that would be exciting. It's really going to take a community of folks to reverse engineer this. It's so much time to create any individual model. Again, that would be something where if we could work with the manufacturers, it would be a lot easier. Just because you know it's 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 a large amount of modeling time, but there's no technical barriers to it. So I think I think it could be very exciting. In this case, I think it might be easier to find the matching piece of Lego that's a close fit. <laughs> yeah, g'day. Um, has much been done about the variety of connectors 
power plug connectors, all the oh. you know, internal uh, hard drive connectors. I mean, is anyone going to actually force an industry standard upon uh, manufacturers? <laughs> It's so interesting that you should mention that. Um, I had a question here about a memorandum of understanding which the EU uh, had some success with in 2009. And what it did was it got a whole lot of mobile phone companies to agree by uh, a couple of years later, 2011, to have a universal charger across that market. So that was, that was um, estimated to... Uh, to impact about 500 million mobile phones right. in the EU countries? Well, yeah. it's had a pretty good carry-on effect because over time, all of the phones, I mean, pretty much all phones have, I mean, everything has either a micro USB or a USB-C port on it now, uh, which is pretty cool, except Apple, because Apple. <laughs> uh, it's a, Apple got around it by including an adapter. So if you buy these phones in Europe, it includes an adapter. I, I think standardization is wonderful. Um, kind of the mecca, like the high mark for repairability is the, the desktop PC, right? We, we got to where there were fairly standard connectors, fairly standard, right, uh, SATA and power and everything else. As, as Unfortunately, as things have gotten smaller, we, it's fragmented more. Um, and the same uh, digital design tools that make 3D printing easy also make it easier for manufacturers to like redesign things every time. Um, it's very hard to legislate design consistency. Um, so really the only way to do that is for engineers that are working at companies to work together and cross-pollinate and create industry standards. I think that's one of those areas where change kind of has to come with, with it, from within rather than being forced externally. Oh, it seems great that uh, the Nebraskan government and some other US states are um, sort of coming on board with the right to repair movement. Do you know much about the Australian government and if there's anything happening here? Are we uh, up with the game or are we lagging behind? Well, that's why I'm here. I want to have a conversation with all of you. Uh, so right now, I mean, this is a relatively new issue, so I don't think that anybody is, has worked on this yet. However, I'm sure someone in this room uh, knows a, a member of the government. So, like, have a conversation and talk about it. That's really how all of these states' grassroots things have happened. Uh, the Illinois bill, we had, we had our plans for the year. We had no plans to introduce a bill in Illinois. And one day, a bill pops up, and they introduced the right to repair bill there. And, and we were asking around. Nobody knew how it happened. And then I, I saw the guy's name who introduced it, and I didn't recognize the name. And then I clicked on it, and it showed me his face, and I recognized him. It turned out I'd fixed his phone for him. And I happened to have a link, and I shared the link to the reference legislation with him, and then he was like, yeah, this makes sense. And so then he went ahead and introduced the bill in Illinois. It's like, that's how it starts. And this is such a common sense issue that when you bring it to people, uh, everyone is interested in this, right? Uh, in Massachusetts, the most recent auto right to repair law, they put it on the ballot. People actually got a vote. 87% of people voted in favor of this. This is not a conservative versus liberal issue. This is not a uh, you know free market versus uh, local protection issue. This is just common sense. This benefits everyone except a very few companies that are trying to uh, exercise a monopoly. Well, this was a great presentation, first of all. Um, how, what do you think about the Google's Project Aura, which is more of a model of phones where you can replace your components whenever you change, and you don't have to throw your entire phone, you just can replace if you want a high resolution camera, and it got recently dumped. Uh, what's your view on that? It would have reduced a great environmental impact, but just wanted to know what do you right. think about it? Right. What do you think? I think people are here to hear All right. what okay. you think. Okay, so, 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 pro, so pro, the idea with Project Aura was that it was an upgradable phone mm -hmm. so that you could upgrade the camera module, you could upgrade uh, you know, the battery, the, the, swap out the different components. It was really cool. Um, unfortunately, they announced that they worked on it for several years. I actually know a lot of the people that worked on the team, and then Google's executives decided they didn't have the budget for it anymore, and so they canceled it. Uh, and everyone else that was going to build a modular, upgradable cell phone didn't do it because they thought Google was going to do it. So now we don't have an, a modular phone, except the Fairphone, where they actually just released a camera module upgrade for it. So Fairphone's trying to do this. I think that, you know, that this would be really cool. I don't think it would necessarily ever be a mainstream feature. There's some trade-offs. There's some durability trade-offs when you go to something modular. Um, I think that the free market actually does provide modularity. Um, I don't think that we should necessarily completely feel guilty about upgrading our devices. If you need to for work or you need the functionality to upgrade your phone every two years, I think that's okay as long as your old phone doesn't go in the drawer. 
what you need to do is sell it on Gumtree, sell it online, get it in the hands of somebody else who's going to use it. Because the key is to look holistically across the entire economy and say, every single device that we've manufactured needs to be in use at this moment in order to get the maximum utility out of, out of the resources expended to make it. Uh, and so it's okay if you need a better phone, sell yours, get a new one, and the free market effectively, Gumtree is providing the modularity, right? Uh, and so it can have kind of the net, the same environmental benefit as everyone upgrading their phone in place. You can upgrade by getting a new phone, giving yours to somebody who's upgrading theirs. I think we have time for one more question. How does the repair and or altering interact with uh, product liability? I mean, there's everybody's propensity to sue these days. If you repair something and somewhere down the track it goes to somebody else or something and there's a mishap, um, the original manufacturer is going to deny liability. Right. Yes, this is a great question, and this is a concern that the manufacturers bring up. This is usually the first concern that they bring up with right-to-repair legislation. Uh, and so if you think about all of the categories of products that are out there and some of the potential dangers that could come from repairing them, and you've, you're ranking you know, the potential dangers from them, you, you know, you've got cell phones on one end of the spectrum, and you probably have motor vehicles and cars on the opposite, right? Like things that you could fix wrong that might hurt you, like a car is fairly high up on the list, right? Uh, if you repair the brakes wrong, you could be in trouble. Uh, so fortunately, we've had all the right to repair, and we've had the ability for people to work on their own cars and, people, and, and local mechanics to work on vehicles that they're not authorized to work on for the last 40, 50 years. And we have a huge amount of case law that demonstrates that this isn't really a liability problem for the manufacturer. The liability goes on the person who did the repair, if they should have known better and you know, they were independently licensed and then they, they did it incorrectly, it's on them. If you do it yourself and you hurt someone, then the liability is on you. And I think that's the natural way that it ought to work. So in general, product liability laws support independent repair and the, the laws work just fine. And so the right to repair laws haven't really had to address that liability issue very much because existing law protects manufacturers reasonably well. So Kyle, we should wrap now, but um, it would be wonderful if you could leave all of us with something tangible that we could do to be part of the change that we want to see. So when I talk with people and I say, you know, take a phone apart, take something apart, like everybody is afraid. We have this fear. We all grow up and, and we're being taught not to take things apart. I, I, I teach science fairs and I have kids come by and I'll hand them an iPod and say, do you want to take apart an iPod? And they look at me like I'm crazy because all of the adults their entire life have been telling them not to take things apart. Uh, so get someone young, encourage them to take something apart. Uh, the next time that you have something that's broken, uh, don't be afraid to take it apart just to learn how it works. The worst that's going to happen is it will stay broken, <laughs> right? That's not so bad. Uh, and maybe you'll learn something in the process. Please join me in thanking Carl Wynn. And I think we should do another little thank you to Leo there for being so brave and coming up and fixing <laughs> Thanks, with us. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.